Okay, so I think it's uh, 4 p.m. and three minutes after that. So I think we can start because it's not in a German way at the university that we wait 15 minutes and we talk. We want to start fast and to, to, uh, to welcome every, everyone to our webinar, Theatre and Communitas, uh, which is dedicated to diverse forms of commonality in contemporary performing arts. Um, and it's a uh, session number three with our a great guest from Warsaw, Wojtek Zemilski. Um, hello to Warsaw. And my name is Dorota Saevska. I'm an assistant professor of inter art at the University of Zurich. And together with my colleague, um, Louise de Caille, uh, we are very pleased to welcome uh, you and, of course, our guest, uh, Wojtek Zemilski, a theater director from Warsaw, whose two performances come together and enter full screen, we uh, want to discuss today. Uh, but first, um, I would like to, to make a short introduction to our webinar, let's say, for those who haven't been here before. That's what I said before, it's the, the second, uh, the, the third uh, session of our webinar. Uh, and this webinar was created as a part uh, of a larger research project, which is called Crisis and Communitas, in which uh, we as a team of uh, five people um, from the University of Zurich um, explore performative uh, forms of commonality in arts, culture and politics. So the shortly, uh, to sum up, the project investigates uh, the dialectical interrelationship between uh, crisis and communitas and situates itself within a tradition, a research and philosophical tradition that examines the connections uh, between social crises uh, and possibilities of communitarian ideas or even also communitarian uh, movements, let's say, political movements. Um, if you want uh, or you would like to, to, to know more about our project, please check our website, crisisandcommunitas.com. Uh, I don't want to, to, to spend uh, now more uh, time uh, talking about it. Um, maybe this, uh, two really sentences to the format of our webinar. So it's a very simple one. Uh, we start uh, like in previous sessions with a talk with our guest and uh, which will take around uh, one hour or 45 minutes, we see, and then we open the discussion. But of course, during the conversation, um, mm, uh, you are welcome to join the chat if you want to mm -hmm. ask questions or express your opinions and make comments. We tried with Luis to manage, <laughs> maybe not control, but somehow to manage it, which is not always so easy, let's say. So to be like divided in, in two uh, uh, channels. Um, so, but first of all, I'm very, very happy really to, to invite you, Wojtek, and to introduce uh, you as our, our uh, main guest. Um, uh, your body of work uh, is for me an exceptional uh, one, especially in the Polish uh, theater landscape. Uh, since uh, it is giving up the idea of, uh, of a director as a big creator or a genius who is like uh, controlling all the time the stage reality. Um, for me, uh, theater is much more like an, an enactment of political philosophy, which is, I think, for all of us very interesting also regarding to our topic. Uh, so the, the research on, on commonality. Um, but uh, it sounds very serious, but I think you, you have, uh, or your theater, your, your work has something like a very, very playful form or lightness uh, of doing theater. And you ask a very, in this very playful form, very fundamental questions about the communication in theater and about the political responsibility of theater makers. So actors, performers, uh, dancers, but also, of course, of director. I personally was uh, very impressed by your uh, first piece I could see in Warsaw, um, I think 2000, uh, maybe it was like 10 years ago, uh, Mała Narracja, small narration, which had a form of uh, performance lecture um, about your grandfather, the famous artist, Wojciech Dzieluszycki, um, who had collaborated um, with the communist secret police. Mm -hmm. uh, and this um, 
little narrative or small narration, whatever we call it, uh, was based uh, uh, on uh, Wojtek Zemilski's memories as a child uh, and um, on the reaction of his family uh, to this press news or media news, let's say, but also on the documentation of, of the last months of uh, uh, his grandfather's uh, life. So the, the story, which is, I think, very important, not only for this work, but uh, for the whole theater was punctuated by screening paragraphs from Ludwig uh, Wittgenstein's Uncertainty, uh, who I think is a very, very important philosopher for you, since you are also a philosopher, not only a theater uh, director. Uh, I would like to refer later a little bit to, uh, uh, to uh, his uh, philosophy of language. Um, so, um, but coming back to this performance, um, maybe I share with you a screen um, in order to show you um, some um, uh, photos from this. Um, in this performance, uh, Wojtek Zemilski was also not only the director, but also a performer on the stage. Uh, which is, is sorry? Yes, that is me. <laughs> uh, 10 years ago, <laughs> that's what I said before. And as you can see, uh, he sits uh, without, almost without any movement. Of course, on the photo, it's uh, always like that. <laughs> but it was also in the, uh, on the stage uh, like that, uh, without any movement behind a lectern. Um, he speaks in a, in a voice deprived somehow uh, of any expression or any uh, intonation, so that once had the impression that, that what I remember or I, what I can remember, that the language itself speaks here on the stage and not so much uh, him as a person, as an individual. Uh, the very intimate uh, performance uh, transforms uh, through that on the stage into an like a self exposure of a philosopher uh, who is asking permanently, of course not directly, but through the um, through the performance, through the uh, aesthetic, uh, how certain you can be as a viewer about the story I'm telling you. Um, in another performance, which uh, maybe you, some of you could see here in Zurich um, at the Zurich Theater Spectacle 2017, um, the performance was called Jeden Guest, One Gesture. Uh, four actors with hearing impairments uh, tell their stories using sign languages. Wojtek uh, Jemilski asked here about the uniqueness as well as the universality um, of nonverbal communication in this case, and about the possibility, what was for me as a, the most important, I think, aspect of this performance, um, about the possibility to share the otherness. And I think it's like something what is really uh, repetitive uh, uh, um, uh, form in, in your performances, also in the enter full screen. Um, but to the possibility to share the otherness through, uh, in this case, bodily expression, or maybe only bodily expression, so through de gestures, movements, uh, and signs. Uh, in this performance, uh, we can also find uh, the echo of Wittgenstein's famous sentence, so that the limits of my language uh, means the limits of my uh, word. So maybe regarding um, to those two experiences, so my personal experiences also as a, as a viewer, as a spectator, I would like to ask you, Wojtek, uh, a little bit maybe a general question uh, regarding the theater. It means like how important is the language game for you or maybe for your understanding of, uh, of theater at all, and how the language uh, is participating in the process of community building in theater. Wow, well, uh, thank you, Dorota. I think that that second question is, <laughs> how many years do we have? Um, of course, <laughs> without end. <laughs> so uh, to start off, what you may be hearing is my son building another language game uh, right next door. Um, 
give me a second, nie Andrzeju. Dobrze, to nie do mnie, to do mamy, proszę, dobra? I think that's a lovely moment because it, it's a moment that we all know, if not from your own experience at home, then from some Zoom experiences. And that is the moment which shows us how different the world we have. And that is that different language games suddenly are on the same spot. And of course, when a child comes in, that is a radical moment of that. But even when we're just talking on Zoom and we're on the computer and we're just going to check an email, you know, or just check a message or just do some a little thing at the same time, we're building two language games at the same time. Um, and I think that is really radically different today from a situation in a theater. And I think the convention of theater has, has developed a very precise language game and has taken uh, several centuries to build a structure which protects this language game from, from other ones. Um, so the question of language game, um, I guess the first impression may be that is that that is that I just love you know diving in language and in, and looking at language. Uh, however, uh, to, to be perfectly honest, my my relationship with in general the thinking about language is ambiguous. Uh, so I studied philosophy, and my biggest problem studying philosophy I studied for six years was a philosophy of language, and that was. And, and I think that my main issue with it was that, that in contemporary philosophy, I saw it as a complete obsession with language that was, and it's not just about a linguistic turn, it's about a linguistic filter that is so strong that I felt it didn't, it doesn't allow us to live at all, <laughs> because bef it's like before living, we have to think about the language we use when we think about living and and we never finish thinking about that language. And there's a wonderful anecdote about uh, Wittgenstein, which is that uh, he uh, decided to stop teaching several times. He did that. He was you know, a professor uh, and, and he would quit every once in a while, deciding he's got enough of it. Uh, several times he became a gardener, but one of the times he became a um, elementary school teacher and he had to quit very quickly because he started off by deciding that, okay, he's going to teach math to these six-year-olds, but if they want to learn how to count, first they have to understand what a number is. <laughs> so, and of course that didn't go so well. Uh, so that is a little bit my issue with, um, uh, with, with this kind of perspective where we look at everything through the filter of language However, I discovered when doing theater, when working on theater, that, that my relation indeed is, indeed is ambiguous because I am quite entangled in, in language in, in many ways. Um, and I see language as being a very powerful kind of uh, cultural, um, um, how should I put it, cultural uh, glue um, or um, an aspect of reality which defines quite strongly who we are and how we behave. And what we were talking about before the formal beginning of this uh, meeting, I think is significant that when you said, Dorota, that when we, you know, when you change the language, that there's a different group of people here today. Um, and that may be because they don't speak another language. It may be because they don't feel as comfortable in another language. Um, it may be because they just don't feel that something is addressed to them when, when there's a different language. Uh, so suddenly, I think it, it very clearly starts to define the territory that we are in. And I think that the term, Wittgenstein's term of, um, uh, of language games is, is a lovely term, in part because it's very uh, unsharp. It's not very focused, so, and I like terms which are not that sharp. I think, in, especially in arts, it's very good to have this, this leeway, you know, this, this kind of blurry area, which allows us to kind of be a little bit more intuitive and have a little bit more freedom. Uh, if you compare it, you know, I don't want to go into philosophy too much, but if you compare it to the young Wittgenstein, who was like, no, this is the way we define things. 
uh, language games basically gives us this idea that we are in a in a world which which is in part defined or strongly defined by the language we use and by the way we play with this language. And this language can be a spoken language, it can be a visual language, but it is a set of conventions that, that we tacitly accept. Yes, we, 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 I guess we can call it a paradigm in a way. Um, and of course, if we are moving in theater, which is for me based to a great extent on a symbolic value, so not on the physical fact of us being together, but on the fact that it is a symbol of something else, uh, then having such a, such a very powerful ingredient really helps to, 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 to move very quickly forward. And I think when you, when you mentioned One Gesture, that was a show where it was, I think, the, the most kind of obvious because you have people on stage who use a language which you don't understand and you do not have access to it. You think you may have access to it because you think it's a gesture, you know, this is me, this is you, so we can get along. But then as it moves forward, you realize, no, this is, I don't, I, I, I have no idea what is happening here. Unless of course you are quite aware and, and somehow involved in this, in, in the issues related to the deaf community. And so that was really for me, on the one hand, of course, it was that particular community, that particular culture, which was fascinating. On the other, it was a fantastic kind of case study of language games and of how we, we build our community through the language and through playing with language. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. How did you, sorry, I have a question, very technical one. How did you work uh, with, uh, with them, with the actors uh, for uh, one gesture? Had you have a translator or you um, yes, we, got access in a different way, let's say? Well, you see, I, I think that's a, that's a great question um, for several reasons, but one of them that it shows how little we are aware of what is sign language and what is the world of the deaf, because if I had a, like I had a, a, a performance many years ago, which I directed in Moldova and none of the performers spoke um, English or any other language other than Moldovan. And then it would be obvious that I would be, that I needed an interpreter. I mean, I spent two months there. What am I going to do with them? Uh, while here we often have this idea that, well, we can somehow communicate when you know, sign language is a full language. It is a full universe, conceptual universe. Uh, and if I don't have access to it, then I can only communicate on a very, very, very basic level. So um, I would say, yes, most of the time uh, there was an interpreter or almost all of the time there was an interpreter. It happened near the end that once no interpreter could come to an individual rehearsal which I had with a particular performer who didn't know any Polish so I couldn't even write if I had a problem but because I decided at the very beginning that we would have a lesson a, a lesson that they would teach us sign language mm -hmm. at, at the beginning of each rehearsal for 45 minutes and I was a total fan I just loved it and I had some talent for it uh, so so I learned very quickly and I'm really proud to say that I had one I think three or four hour rehearsal without an interpreter, just me and the actor. And I was like, wow, I'm managing to communicate. I'm, you know, I'm doing this. And he knows that it means I understand. And then I do this and it means many. And then I do, you know, this and it means to change, but this means to translate and it works. <laughs> so, so, so it was the, the, you know, the magic of discovering that you, you actually manage to communicate in a language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. but the, 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 I mean, I could, I could go on and on about, about that experience because if you want a mind blowing experience in your life, start studying sign language. It's, it's crazy because your body starts to be a different body. You're just, it, it feels normal at the beginning. You're like, yeah, you know, I, I understand, but once you understand the semiotic power of your body, it is insane. It's just insane. It's like, you know, 
dancing and speaking through dance like you're suddenly your dance makes sense mm -hmm. literally <laughs> um so yeah yeah, maybe to to switch to come together and the um, issue of community a bit more precisely in relation to this very uh, play, um, because here you've been you've been talking about um, theater and language as a way of framing um, human encounters and communication in a way, and also throughout your work with the actors. Um, but I also find interesting that you say that theater is for you also always a symbol of something else. And in coming together, uh, one could say that theater is um, addressed as a symbol of community that is always a subject of irony. Also, I mean, not only through the play, because the play fails at <laughs> building the community, but also through them, through the through what the actors say, say themselves. They always say, uh, it's a play about community, it's about coming together, but of course it never really, it never, um, it's never achieved the community. Um, so it's always um, addressed with um, big irony, and the, the community is not. On, I mean, it's not always. It's not only the theater as a symbol of community, but it's also the community as a fantasy of theater or, or as an illusion of theater that never uh, concretizes. Um, and I've been wondering um, what importance does the, um, the notion of community have for you in your work? Is it? Um, conceptual point of departure? I mean, a notion you wanted to reflect upon, or is it just practically an issue you always return to throughout your practice? And maybe asked a bit more uh, simply, do you believe in this fantasy of theater, of mm -hmm. um, building a community? Yes, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a torn romantic. <laughs> so, you know, I'm a romantic that went through six years of philosophy um, or to put it in a more Polish, with a more Polish uh, touch to it, I'm an atheist who was brought up as a Catholic. Uh, so you you maintain your you know your feeling of spirit and of a, a, a bigger entity and of and of a certain hope, uh, and at the same time you've become somehow maybe bitter or let's call it elegantly critical. Uh, and and distanced, and you are you you feel like you're more aware, and and I guess a big part of of why I do art is 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 about trying not to become bitter. So even when I turn towards irony, I try to not turn it into a cynical situation, which of course in come together, I guess it's debatable whether it's cynical or not. Uh, but I. I try to kind of maintain, you say that there is no community. I think I would disagree because I think that the community, at least that is my impression, we would have to talk to, you know, to, to spectators uh, to see their, their opinions. But I think that there is a very strong sense of community that is being created in the audience, but it's not the sense of, it's not the community that, that is explicitly being, being talked about. Mm -hmm. So it is not the community, it is not being one with the people who are on stage. It is not being one with the performance as such. It is not making the stage disappear and kind of, you know, joining this utopic idea of a, of a community that kind of suddenly erases all frontiers. But it is very strongly a community of people who are faced with a very strong situation which they have to deal with. And in, in many of the performances, they, they're quite different. You know, each night was quite different, uh, but there were many where the audience members negotiated between them. They negotiated what position to take, whether they should go on or not, if it makes sense or not, if they should come, if, if several people should join and, and go on stage or not. Um, and there were, you know, there, there are many stories of, of how this performance, kind of what happened in the performance. Um, and, and there are some actually where a community was built even stronger uh, and kind of against everything that this performance seems to be saying. One of them was, there was a, a show where there, were, there was a very big group of, of high school students uh, from a, a, what in Poland is called this, a social school. So it's like a private school, but which is, which invest all the money in the school. It's not a private school where the money goes to the owners. 
Um, and that is important because those are schools which are very often working quite a lot on, on their ethos, you know, on, on an ethical um, um, approach to life. And suddenly a group of, I think, you know, eight or 10 students got up and stood on the stage and they refused to leave and they made a, a, a rebellion and they understood you know there's somebody who comes and who says i'm sorry you're really disturbing the show we cannot go on uh, would you please go back to your seat and they looked at the person they, and they said thank you we're staying and you know and we have a protocol for that but all, the protocol only goes that far i mean uh, what can you do the, the the actors then leave so then the performers stay by themselves they are the performers <laughs> the spectators uh, who have become performers in the meantime um, and then somebody from the from the uh, what do you call it from the from the theater from the from the um, from the house um, uh, comes again and tells them well as you see we're not continuing so unless you leave the stage the performance is suspended um, and they stayed for maybe 10 minutes which was completely crazy I mean imagine 10 minutes on stage um, and they you know and having nothing to propose because it's not like they come with a plan um, and and they know what they want to propose instead it's just standing there and going well okay, we're here. So they started improvising, you know, saying, somebody started improvising, saying something. Uh, they proposed a game between them um, because then what to do with that community that suddenly is there. Uh, but going back to your question, um, well, I have, a, 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 I guess, a personal story related to that, uh, to that question of, of uh, uh, community as a, as a, either essential part of theater or a kind of derivative. Uh, and that is when I was a child, my mom was uh, one of the people organizing and producing uh, what was called the open theater festivals in Wrocław. And those were very big festivals of alternative theater, which in the eighties was still quite strong. Um, and there was a very strong aspect of community there. You know, there was, I just, recall a few groups I remember bread and puppet coming quite often from the US so so a lot of these kind of ideas that started off in the 60s and 70s were were kind of implemented in these theater groups and and projects that would travel to Poland and I was a child going there year after year and spending all my time there with these people and really that was something which became part of me and part of my sensitivity and so when the 90s happened, and the 90s in Poland were a very difficult time, I consider that in, in, terms, of, uh, in terms of how theater developed, because it developed into a very institutional theater that became very uh, quite fascinated by modernity. You know? so, so we had these, these big star uh, young directors, but who were doing uh, you know, what I consider very traditional theater. It was very dynamic. It was very uh, you know, provocative, uh, but it was for me growing up as a teenager, it was a huge step back. It was a huge disappointment because suddenly all the issues that seemed like like really things we can think about and work on were gone. They, they just disappeared. Uh, of course, they did exist somewhere, but I wasn't part of them in any way. And, and from what I know, um, they, weren't, they stopped being part of any sort of mainstream or any sort of kind of public space. They became really very distant and marginal. Uh, so I, I retained that, that feeling and that ideal. And in a way, it came back in a very strange way through choreography. So I was, you know, going through this disappointment time after time, and going to theater, and 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 constantly feeling uh, um, um, either upset or just kind of like maybe it's not a place for me. Um, and then after I finished university, I moved to Portugal, and then uh, I started watching all sorts of weird performances, and I realized there's a group of choreographers who are doing a very interesting work and which is quite related to the fact of like, where am I? Where am I as a spectator when I arrive somewhere? What is my space? What is my place? What is the group we're with? Is there, a, is there something special about this situation? 
And the, the very first one was, um, I'm sure all of you know Xavier Leroy, this phenomenal uh, uh, French choreographer. And it was a, a show called Project. Um, and, and it was, you know, at first it looked like people playing football and I thought it was the worst 20, the worst spent 20 years in my life. Uh, because I went to see a show and I'm watching people play ball and it's a little bit like, okay, I understand contemporary art has to be radical, but this is just bullshit. Uh, but after a time, I realized there's more to it. And, and suddenly I realized that it's, a, it's really about how we are together and what sort of rules we obey and how can we deal with different roles and what does it mean that, that, that we are together. Um, and so I, it was a, it was a eureka moment. It was like, yes, it's possible. Another theater is possible. Another way of thinking about performance is possible. And since that moment, it was really, um, one of the key aspects for me, maybe not in all of my projects, but I go back to it quite often. Um, and in a way come together was a little bit of a comment on that as well, because I had several projects where it was a very open situation of really trying to get people to 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 change their way of functioning within a show uh, and to see where it can take us. Um, but at the same time, there are some limitations or, or some some conditionings which which make it much more problematic than 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 in my moments of enthusiasm, I, I wanted it to be. Um, and of course, theater being this symbolic uh, universe, um, I wasn't that scared of doing it on a, on theater as a model, which mm. might have been a little bit mm, naive of me given the Polish context, because it was read by practically all, maybe it had many reviews, maybe 10, maybe 15 in Poland. And maybe there was one that didn't see it just as a theater game just as a show about who is a spectator and who is an actor and what can an actor do and what can a spectator do and that's it so so I was a little bit I think naive to think that it's quite clear that it's a symbol of other things that we live uh, which the spectators that I talked to got quite well but I think that theater critics also have a a little bit of a penchant you know, uh, towards thinking about theater. So when they go and they see a show and they're actors and the actors say something and it's not true and the show is based on that, then they just, they focus on the fact that it's theater and theater has rules which, which are a bit different than the rules of the world. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to ask you um, if the play maybe reacts to forms of theater um, uh, to um, to forms of participatory theater that you've been maybe looking at with um, a critical eye, but I think you already answered this question a bit. But just I just I wanted to say, yeah. I mean, by sketching your experience also as a spectator mm -hmm. and um, mentioning your um, experience, for example, um, at uh, Xavier Leroy's performance. But um, maybe to come back to come together, um, I, I also understand what you mean with um, the community feeling, and it's interesting that you thought. You talked about ethics and the, these uh, students studying ethos, um, I mean ethics, mm -hmm. um, because for me, um, of course, I, all, all, I only saw the video and in this video, one, uh, no one participates. So in the end, it becomes a spectacle of the actor's performance begging for participation, which is also a statement which was very interesting to watch it as a spectacle, really. <laughs> but. Um, by just turning into a spectacle, it's all for me. It was not only about the spectatorship, but also about the profession of actors themselves, that kind of um, sacrifice themselves for the audience. And the most um, striking moment is, for example, the moment where the blonde actress um, really begs and fall into despair on uh, despair on the floor, and she also uh, drools and so on, and. Um, as a spectator of it, uh, of, I mean, spectator of the video, I was, um, of course, it's funny because she says it's so humiliating, but still the audience uh, remains sitting. So 
but one feels uneasy by 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 laughing, of course. So it does um, disturb the spectator, the, the spectator in its power position of just looking at this actress performing despair in a way. So I was wondering also you, if the play. I, I can tell you uh, uh, one of the. It, it's really the history of the show. There could be a book about the history of the showings of that show and the things that happened. So in that scene, at the premiere, the 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 actress starts crying and she cries and 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 you know and despairs and and reaches out to us and and she's really desperate and a ten year old boy gets up and walks on stage. Mm -hmm. And nobody knows what to do because we didn't have a protocol for that. You know, we had a protocol for spectators coming in and we were ready for it and everybody was there. And, you know, the ushers and you're like the whole thing is, a, but not that a child goes on stage. And mm -hmm. so suddenly he's with her and he's helping her and it becomes like, what, what are we, what? And she, and she suddenly she stops and she looks at him and I see that she's completely panicking. She's a very good actress, so it's, it doesn't show too much. But I can see that she is panicking. Uh, and then the usher finally arrives and, and saves the day and the kid goes off the stage. And, mm -hmm. and after the show, I, I go immediately to her, of course, and I say, oh, my God, that was crazy. And she says, that was my son. <laughs> so uh, and we go like, oh no, what did we do? We're monsters. We just made this child, you know, go into a trauma. She's going to have a traumatic experience. And she says, no, no, no. I, I already talked to him. And he said that it wasn't that he was upset. It's that it's an obvious thing. Somebody is asking for help. So you help. What is the big deal? And I thought that was fantastic because it really it shows you that there's much more space for really digging into that situation than what we are ready to take on in our language game. Yeah, yeah. But it's especially in these moments that one sees that the play um, questions the spectator and the actor in um, issues of responsibility in, in the ethical sense. And I think especially just to come back to your questioning of whether this irony turns into a cynicism at some point, I, I didn't see it that way at all. I mean, it's ironic, but it's never bitter. It's never bitter or cynical for me, um, mm -hmm. the ethos of the play as, as it's happened, especially, especially because it sometimes turns into existential <laughs> questioning almost of the relationship between spectator and actor. So this moment is a good example of that. Of this. But for me, it was not simple. There, there is the thing that you did not see, which is the the intervention of the of the spectator, and mm. that was the thing that I think I spent the most time of any scene I've done in my entire life was on that moment. What happens when a spectator comes on to to do something? What do we do? Because the, you know, when you're building a show, you don't know. It's not like I, you come up with a with an idea, and the idea contains obvious solutions. We we only knew that we wanted the, to to provoke the audience, to put the audience in a situation where they will really want to go on stage eventually. But we didn't know what is going to happen. So at the beginning, all options were open, including that the the audience member comes on stage and actually changes everything you know, mm -hmm. taken somewhere else and makes a different show and is hidden and is, you know, or ends the show. Like, what do we do? What is the answer? What is the logical step? And the logical step was, and this took quite a long time to understand, was that there has to be a very clean way of saying, this is a theater production. It is part of a repertory theater with professional actors and they're representing something. And this representation is all about representation. So if you, if you believe that representation is something that you can just take away and just go, here we go, well, then you are being very hopeful or a little bit maybe naive because reality doesn't just pop. You know, it's not, uh, what was that film uh, where you, um, uh, with 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 Carrie with Jim Carrey where where he's in a 
um, in this big bubble and he thinks it's the world. And then- The dark sunshine of the spotless mind. No, 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 no. Another one. The Truman Show. Yes, Truman Show, thank you. (laughs) Yes, Truman Show, exactly. So uh, unfortunately, that's not how it works. You know, you, 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 you burst the bubble and then there's another bubble, of course. Um, that's how it works. And that's how it works around us. You know, you think you get somewhere and then you discover, okay, now I have to really work again. Uh, and in the case of the theater, the theater has to very cleanly show itself as theater. And so we've developed a whole protocol to, to make that very clear and clean. And at the beginning, we didn't, it, it wasn't working that well. It took us several shows to really get to a point where I was happy. One of the things, for instance, that we did install was that after any intervention of any spectator the actors stop they so they don't continue they meet together to discuss when they were what point they will restart on and they restart at least two sentences before the moment where the interruption happened so that they they put out a message which says, this is very fake. This is as fake as it gets. We know the text by heart. We're going to repeat the text. We're repeating a text. It's nothing. And the other thing that the actors have to do, and that is really tricky, is to be much more convincing than they were before. So they're saying the same text, but they have to be really, really, really convincing, really with the audience, so that you get back to that feeling of discomfort of like, I know it's fake. I know it's not true. I know I shouldn't be thinking, you know, my optimistic ideas, but I can't stop myself. Uh, so I, I think I like very much your idea of to making a book uh, with this documentation of the documentation of every performance, because it uh, uh, reminds me as, a, as an idea of, um, of the idea of um, like a model book, you know, by Brecht made also of the performance with the many variation, which is also always like an idea of uh, showing a model of theater. No? And in this sense, in this particular uh, performance, I would see it as a a model of the, um, of theater as community. I wouldn't I, never uh, 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 say that it's uh, about the participation which is impossible or community which is impossible because theater is always being together, even if the, there is the being together of differences. And again, it was like a question for me: uh, how we co- how can we communicate when we are different, different also among the spectators and performers, but also like spectators and performers, they are two different groups. Uh, so um, maybe, I don't know, uh, I would like to, 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 to go uh, further to the, to the next uh, performance, but I, I, I thought maybe there is uh, now like a gap also for you, uh, I mean the audience, maybe you would like to ask uh, some questions um, regarding this uh, particular performance come together um, in order not to stop. <laughs> so the way of thinking, yeah. Nina? Sorry, as uh, I think as a host, I can't really uh, raise my hand with Zoom. So I was like dancing. Um, well, many thanks for your interesting remarks. I was just um, something what you said about uh, coming together and this strong sense of community that kind of uh, grew in the audience and it strikes me with with an exp- um, like a feeling I had when I was watching the piece that these methods that are used in the in the in the play to kind of split the audience in order to provoke one of the parts to kind of go on stage and I think maybe also these these actual mechanisms of splitting what where would kind of um, like glued together the audience. I mean, in this specific um, recording we saw. For me, for, for example, it was like, oh yeah, now the, the the smokers have to go on stage, but okay, I smoke, but really I don't smoke. So I'm just like negotiating which group I'm actually belonging to. 
in order not to have to go on stage, <laughs> kind of. Mm -hmm. And that for me was really interesting because it also shows like this splitting and uh, putting together or trying to put together in a new way, which also shows like there isn't really like it's not just these two groups like the spectators and the, the performers but there's also like uh, female bodies and male bodies there is smokers non-smokers there's group a and group b and it all kind of intermingles um it, some years uh, later i saw a show by superamas do you know them uh which was all about it was just projections and it asked different groups of spectators to read out loud what was what was written there and so for instance there would be we are the smokers and we think that blah 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 um but uh, no it wasn't projections i think it was on a you, you you watch it on a on a cell phone i don't remember very well but in any case it was addressing what you're talking about even more kind of pushing it to the limit where it was really where you really had to kind of declare yourself as part of a specific group um, and, and be a chorus. But of course here that was, uh, it was also trying to find like, trying to find ways of identifying you so, so we can enter some sort of conversation. But then again, you are a spectator and you are in an extremely privileged position where you do not need to actually put yourself in that group. What you're saying, yeah, so so that you are negotiating your identity, and I think that is also super interesting. Uh, I wrote my my masters about the identity of the theater spectator, uh, and one of the one of the more interesting aspects for me of identity was that there's this ambiguity between identity as something which you define yourself, self identification, which is connected to a whole history of reflex reflexive identity. So subjectivity or agency is something which is which has to do with me looking at myself, and then this kind of objective or outside identity where somebody else is saying something about me. And this I haven't found at the time. It was you know many years ago. Um, any philosopher who would really treat it in a way which I would be happy with. So there's always this ambiguous moving from one field to the other, um, and. And yes, I think that in theater, that is that is also quite a strong um, tension, I would say. So how we see ourselves as an audience is one thing, as an audience member and as a member of a group and as, as a potential, yes. So this kind of feeling of, oh, we can do something or I am part of this or, or that is true, I want to join it. And the other, which is, well, actually, you are a group of 50 people who are probably not going to do anything together, ever. Yeah, and I mean, that is even stronger, not sitting in the audience while the, the play is going on, but like watching it on screen and you don't even have the possibility to, to kind of interact and still mm -hmm. it somehow kind of approaches us, I don't know. Yeah, you can always imagine your reaction in this situation. That's also what uh, uh, Louise said before, that it's uh, all the time like testing, exploring also the, the imaginary uh, potential of the theaterist community. I think it's interesting because really like uh, even with the recording, we could feel uh, how we could react on that. So it was like fulfilled also with our potential reactions. In this sense, it's only ex um, so like the um, how to say it, uh, like the proof for that, that it's, and it is functioning as a model, no? because we also are only a model as spectators. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we can be like rethink with, um, within this, this structure. Um, so maybe uh, we could like uh, make this uh, shift uh, to the audience who is only watching the screen, because I think it was also our idea to, to think about the come together as uh, the live performance. Um, together with the uh, enter full screen, which is like uh, could be perceived as a continuation of uh, the come together, but in a totally different situation, the context of pandemics, and uh, like in this uh, emergency solution, um, uh, which uh, had to be found um, 
uh, for the participatory theater yes, and the digitality. Uh, I would like to maybe to uh, um, introduce your small description of uh, Enter Full Screen, which I uh, found on your uh, uh, website uh, and which I really appreciated. Mm. So I read. Once upon a time of Zoom meetings, selfie broadcasting and Snapchats uh, mask, uh, there was a country that had LGBTQ plus free zones, zones free of queer ideology. They called them in the country, but meant zones free of queer people. The country was part of the European Union. The zones were completely mundane and full of strange creatures. We went there, the rest is history. End of quote. First, before we uh, uh, go to this political question, I found uh, very interesting your choice of the fairy tale, let's say, as a format uh, for the digital uh, performance. So it's a genre uh, uh, connected to, to the very oral tradition, again, so much more than to, to the written one of storytelling, again, storytelling <laughs> in your performance. Um, it allows us somehow to, 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 to think about the communication itself again, and, but also to explore the collective unconscious, which I find very interesting as a continuation of this idea of, uh, of come uh, together as a model, let's say, um, of collective unconscious with all our fears, anxieties, uh, traumas, what you said also before, but also wishes and desires, yeah? even if these desires are based on violence, for example which is in this uh, performance, I think has very important dimension. Uh, but also fairy tales, uh, which I find uh, interesting uh, from this uh, perspective of building models, let's say for communities um, are not limited to one tradition or one culture. They are like um, uh, cross, cross cultural, let's say, uh, let's call it like that. We can easily find the, the common elements um, uh, spread over uh, countries, cultures, tradition, and so on. Um, so I, I, I was wondering um, how you uh, did connect this idea of, of fairy tale but, um, or uh, fairy tale as a, as a model uh, of narration with the digitality. So, and this new mode of uh, doing theater. Mm -hmm. One answer would be that I, I didn't do it. Uh, Snapchat did it. Um, you know, I have many serious problems with, with theater, and one of them is that, especially the theater that is intellectually ambitious, hardly ever knows what fun is. And I think that is really sad. Uh, it has been changing, so there are some cases recently which are a bit more optimistic. Uh, but especially, as you know, in, in Poland, uh, there is still a very strong tendency towards uh, presenting everything as extremely, extremely serious. And if you're not doing something which looks and feels serious, then you're not a serious artist. Uh, and I just don't have this kind of ambitions and I don't have this kind of need. And as a spectator, I just cannot it's it's just not me i i just stop watching um so it it was it 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 was always quite natural for me to look for forms which would be engaging and i i really don't find that problematic knowing all the Guy de Bors and all the you know brechts and all the problems that they claim that the spectacle brings i really think there are other problems that are a bit more serious and and one fundamental problem is if you're not engaging people if you're just engaging the same old crowd then nobody cares really if it's spectacle or not spectacle it really is not the point so i don't have a problem embracing spectacle and i think that is the a, a first kind of premise but to be more specific relating to um to the fairy tale well I guess it was a bit of an intuitive process related to, first of all, to the situation of the pandemic and to this kind of dreamlike um, feeling that I think all of us had 
for some time, then we lost it, then we regained it, regained it, and now I don't know where we are anymore. But there cer certainly was, for me and for most people I know, a, a quite an extensive period where we lost the, the feeling of reality, where, it, like, you know, you spend your life either just closed in your space or closed in your space going through Zoom and through the screen to access everything. And although I embraced it uh, as an artist and as a teacher, um, it was still, it's still something that, that just makes you go crazy because you just lose notions of, of, of reality. Um, and so that is the first kind of moment where, where the question of how are we going to treat that reality arises. But of course, then I use it as an opportunity to think about the fact that I live in a country and in a reality and in a world where that feeling of, of this not being real is omnipresent. I mean, we have that in Poland, but we had Donald Trump as American president for four years. And that really felt like a dream, like a very bad, very crazy dream, but really crazy. And it did feel like a fairy tale because he, he looked and acted and behaved like a fairy tale character. So I think that that these times, you know, conveniently called the post truth, um, I would rather put it into more uh, this idea that the heterotopia, which before was reserved for specific spaces, uh, right now is kind of devouring every inch of our lives. So uh, rather than to, to claim that there's an autonomous zone where we can, where we can, you know, rebuild truth, that is also being done, of course. Uh, we can just go, okay, well, let me tap into that energy. Let me, let me dive into that. And let's start off with the fact that it is a fairy tale and that it is, it is like fiction because this cannot be real because what I'm telling you cannot be real. I'm not going to be proving to you that this exists because it's too crazy. So instead, I'm just going to tell you, okay, it's a fairy tale. And there's a, a there's an avocado which is you know telling you talking to you about serious community matters and a weird two-eyed uh, being that is telling you what seems like a real story about an earthquake that really happened just a month before. Um, so if we start off with the fairy tale, then it feels like maybe we can go further in our imagining reality because we just we kind of let go of this instinct of having to check the, the truth um, level of that, which I think is, is often the problem if you want to kind of address uh, reality in, in, in the theater of the real or, or you know, documentary theater, that, that we have the instinct of questioning and of going, but wait a minute. So here we start off by doing things which where you go, but wait a minute. And since you said it at the very beginning, then I hope then you kind of let go and then you build your feeling of, of coherence and of this, this world being cohesive on something else rather than the, than the constant nagging of this truth uh, protocol. But we should mention, I think that this fairy tale is performed by what is called European Ensemble. Oh, it was for me uh, quite interesting that, uh, that the actors said that at the beginning, and then they said, this is us, and uh, Europe is our special friend, uh, a friend with benefits, let's say, but at the same time, Europe is depicted in your know, performance as an object, I would say, like uh, really with this liquid emitting, death-like and cordly figure, let's say. I liked it very much uh, because as, as an uh, idea as a figure which is watching and somehow not seeing that what uh, all in the European U Union is um, happens, let's say. And this connection to death has been later also explored in this performance, um, once again in the concept of virtual community. Uh, which I like connected to, to this idea also uh, of the European ensemble, let's say, which is revealed as a community of the dead or maybe as a community with the dead. 
uh, as uh, one of the performers uh, uh, says. Mm -hmm. That yeah. moment, we can also find um, uh, find out that only joy will save us. So that's your joke, let's say again, but of course, which is of course a playful reference to uh, to the ode to joy uh, from the from the final movement of Beethoven's uh, ninth, ninth Symphony, um, that of course became an anthem of Europe, uh, used to represent Europe as a whole or as a, a European unity, let's say. Uh, since I recognize in your performance so a high degree of skepticism towards uh, this European unity, so I would like to ask you, uh, do you perceive Europe as an impossible community? I have, give me a second, I have a t-shirt. <laughs> No, I, I should have prepared myself better. So I have a t-shirt which, which has this European flag turning into a, a sunset and the sign saying Utopia. Um, so, and I actually, I bought it in Norway. It was the most expensive, I think, piece of clothes that I've ever bought. Um, uh, well, yeah, Europe is a big topic. Um, I'm not Eurosceptical in the sense of, uh, you know, considering that the European Union sucks or, or that it's, it should be um, cancelled. Um, however, well, it, it does seem from a perspective of somebody living in a country which actually has actual zones that are declared by the local authorities to be free of LGBT ideology, um, and I know what the what the European Union is doing and is not doing. Um, it it really does feel like like the EU doesn't have any sort of tools that would allow them to actually do something. So so it's it's really sweet that they you know they declared I think yesterday or two days ago that Europe is a LGBT. A zone of LGBT freedom or LGBTIQ uh, freedom, and that is lovely, but that does not change the place where I live. Uh, and so it really does feel. And the the one thing that they do quite well is being this old aunt that keeps telling you that you're you're behaving badly, and, you know, stop behaving badly or else. And this or else is of course suspended because all you can do is put a suspension mark at the end what are you going to do you know throw us out of the house uh maybe but um it, it really does feel like in crucial moments this this community is really not up to the challenge and and you know when i was when i was preparing this piece it was uh right after the first lockdown where there was the when it was discovered that that Italy, um, after I think two weeks of their complete disaster, so when it was just Italy, uh, it it um, it triggered a special protocol, which is a call for help to other countries, and it's a special kind of SOS protocol that they send out to get support from other countries, and not a single country and answered. So uh, in practical terms, when, when shit happens, uh, it seems really difficult to really actually manage to, to, to provide some sort of practical support. Uh, so it is an ambiguous feeling, you know, it, it is, uh, that's one thing, but what comes together with it and that doesn't have, I think that uh, so much to do with the EU as such, but more with the idea of the West and that is that the fact that there's a, a lack of, of solidarity or of, or of kind of a basic thinking together doesn't stop the Western countries from being completely condescending. So, uh, so on the one hand, you don't really get actual support. On the other hand, you get the feeling constantly that those, you know, that the West, the, the everything uh, West from the order uh, uh, so from the river separating Poland from Germany is in another universe which is superior to ours and this feeling of moral superiority um, is, is present on so many levels I could go on and on 
about that, you know, um, things like, you know, the fact that you know, Poland being declared as a terribly anti-Semitic country, uh, and then you look at the statistics and like hate crimes, anti-Semitic hate crimes in France or in Germany are like way higher than in Poland, than in Poland. And, you know, all sorts of kind of issues where we are considered as this poor country that is so troubled and that's, that has so many problems. And that's always from the perspective of the perfect um, civilization that is that just has found the solutions to the universe. So yes, I, I, I do think that is a problem. And because I was working with a European ensemble, that seemed like an obvious thing to approach. And actually the very first thing we were working on before moving towards that topic was the idea of civilization and European civilization and that and we were working on you know Belgium and and Congo and 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 the ideas of of uh, um, of of being civilized today which are quite relative depending on the moment when you're when you're speaking um, yes and and I found for instance that the that the flag the European EU flag was also the flag of the Belgian colony at, at a certain point in, in Congo. So really crazy, crazy things, but that didn't, you know, we ended up going in a very specific direction. So we just kind of, a lot of things had to go, but we kept that, that clear perspective on the EU. Yeah, I think we both would have lots of questions about enter full screen because it's also very dense, but um, maybe it would be time to open the discussion to all the other participants, Dorota. I will try to give shorter answers. I'm sorry. I no, 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 no. Connect uh, one thing to another and then to another. Um, I'll no, no, make no, that is absolutely. I, we should open. Yes, for sure. <laughs> so let's open. Yeah, let's uh, who, who wants to yeah. talk? Yeah. You can ask and comment and express your opinions, whatever. Mm. Or just to react. Okay, well, so um, uh, first, thanks a lot for, for providing that uh, really great, interesting performances and for being here. Um, I have a question about um, don't know how to express uh, best um, the, the theatrical aspect from that performance because you have on the one hand this on the technique side this um, digital reality or virtuality and all these um, technical effects with the animated figures um, in in the scene and on the other hand. Um, uh, the the frame the narrative frame from the fairy tale, but I also maybe I saw or interpreted like too much, but I also saw some elements who reminded me on um, on figures um, or frameworks from the Greek tragedy. I, because, and it's it's not an accident that it's, I, th I thought you called it, or I understand you called it internet play. So it's also um, the theater aspect within and, and the beginning where the um, actors um, tell about um, they can't play at the live stage at the moment. And, and that moment, this theater situation is very present somehow. Um, and then you have the story and then they, there appear figures like this ant who is an, like a narrator in the narration. And it reminds me on the Greek choir somehow. And this Yannick who takes us um, onto a journey is, is some kind of um, like this figure of the messenger from the Greek tragedy who, who bring a, an outside, um, uh, an outer space or an outer world into this scene where it really happens at the moment. And I uh, wanted to ask if that was somehow intended or... Thank you. Uh, no. <laughs> um, it's, uh, I've, I've never thought about it uh, consciously, I think. Um, my son, who you heard for a minute and who just approached here for a second, is obsessed with Greek mythology. So we've been going through the Greek myths for the last year nonstop. So I think it's really part of my thinking whether I want to or no 
of course, besides it being part of my thinking as a as somebody working in in you know European culture, um, but I think in some way, um, some aspects of what you you talked about are connected to the question of the fairy tale. Uh, also, in regards to the fact that I was invited to make a show with six theater actors, which is not something which is very typical for me. Sometimes I make shows with actors, but very often I get to choose whom I work with, and then I choose the performers that best suit my concept or my initial kind of idea. Um, so here I had really, it was a very specific proposal and that is there are six actors that are, that you're going to work with, uh, and you don't really have a choice. So those are the six people, um, and they're from different countries. And, uh, I have, as I told you in a kind of problematic love hate relationship with, with theater. And one of the aspects is of course, connected to representation and to the fact of, of, of feeling representation as a kind of trap where we fall into, and then it's really hard to get ourselves out of it. And, and if you compare it to like how dance treats presence and, and treats the, the aesthetic situation uh, um, conventionally, the, that is uh, quite a big difference. So I think in a way, the fact that, that this is my starting situation very quickly brings me to working with theatricality. Uh, so one of my issues was that I had a problem with the actors telling things because if there is not one person but six, then how are they going to be telling things to us? How are they going to be introducing us into something? Of course, the natural thing in a theater to do is to have a conversation, right? One person talks to another. But if I see one actor talking to another actor on Zoom as if they'd never talked before, you know, and it's something that is documentary, so they're in an LGBT free zone and what one person is going to tell the other, oh, show me where you're going or watch out or, you know, it all feels completely ridiculous. Like, well, we all know that they know what is there. Uh, and the theatrical game, of course, is to suspend the disbelief, but if you're, you're actually there, why would you suspend your disbelief? Why would I be watching somebody on Zoom pretending, you know, all this theatricality in on Zoom? I mean, all of us have seen way too many shows on Zoom in the last year, and that is not really the perfect um, um, uh, landscape, the perfect milieu, the perfect place for theater to happen. If you treat theater as a place where, you know, people represent something. So um, so I had this issue and we were trying to work with it in different ways. And at a certain point I discovered, uh, I love gadgets. So I discovered that there's a possibility of, of putting Snapchat cameras on Zoom, which was at the time a very new thing. So I was like, oh, wow, look at that. I can you know, turn into this or that. Uh, and I thought it was just going to be a gimmick and uh, we were stuck at a certain point with the rehearsals and just for fun, I told them, well, just find any masks you want and just play with the masks. And they became superhuman. So they became, suddenly they were full of enthusiasm and they were engaged and they had fun and they had ideas and they were creative because that is their universe. You know, it's the universe of finding a role. And of course, also it's lots of fun. Uh, but it's also, you know, you become somebody else and you become somebody else instantly. So that way, and, and then I, I realized, okay, once you're an avocado, I'll believe you. I believe that you're having a conversation. So I have no problem with having an avocado tell Yannick, watch out or what are you doing? Because I know it's an avocado. I don't, so, so it's a very kind of, simplistic, I would say, way of, of thinking. Uh, but at the same time, it works with the way your body feels. So you see something and, and that is, it has its internal logic, which is very clean. And I think that in a way allows for a much easier building of theatricality. And that I think connects very easily to archetypes. And that is why I kept the avocado, for instance, which was quite controversial. Many people thought, that okay, yes, you can have masks, but it 
don't make them ridiculous because this is going to like destroy any possibilities of talking about something serious. And I was absolutely, I had no doubts that the avocado needs to stay because the theatricality is there and because the, uh, the I wasn't thinking of, you know, Greek theater, but I was thinking of kind of archetypal situations, yes? So of situations of, of tragedy, of drama, of tension, of, uh, of course, now that you said it, it seems super obvious, you know, somebody is going towards a place where the evil needs to happen and he is participating in it and there's nothing that we can do to stop him, although all the Cassandras that are there are telling him not to go. Uh, so, so in a way, uh, yes, it, it uses it, but I think it uses it because the whole mechanism of theatricality was just set. So kind of uh, when I realized the potential of that, I, I knew what, what direction it had to take. And once again, the, the answer is way too long. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Great question. Thank you. Matthias? Yeah. Hi. Um, so when Yannick is, uh, is walking down the street in this LGBT free zone, I think he's still um, complying to the rules, you know, involving this space and, and turning it into virtual space. He's still complying, no? And that's, that's somehow very ironic and very absurd, no? Um, so what would you say is the relationship between these two spaces, this uh, theatrical space um, given by Zoom and then this real space, which is uh, turned to a into a virtual space? So mm -hmm. is, yes. uh, yeah. Uh, I, I have a friend who is a director of a, of a very kind of, uh, experimental festival of, of avant-garde performance uh, in Belgium. And uh, he saw it and he, he liked the show, but he was very surprised, he told me, by the fact that it's not a radical, that it doesn't, that it doesn't kind of go forward. And I'm not sure if your question is, is about that, but I think it's quite clear that in a sense, it does what Come Together does, which is it it really clearly doesn't cross the limit of performativity in the sense of going into the world and actually changing something. Um, and I think it does that, I suppose it's connected to my very, uh, uh, um, very precise perspective on that. And that is that it's not that performativity is usually completely overrated or at least there's an ease with, with which uh, specifically theater artists keep talking about it as something which kind of just happens. You know, you just do it, you do your show and then you kind of change reality and everything changes uh, just because we do it. And I think there's a level of arrogance which is just absolutely crazy um, combined with, with, uh, with wishful thinking, of course. Um, um, so, I mean, I know many shows which claim to intervene in reality and they do it in a way where you go like what you really think that because an actor goes on the street and he has a sign that that actually that actually changed something or because he stops a passerby and he talks to the person and then you're going to be saying that you know it changed it like one person one conversation can change every maybe but not it's not a given it's not like it's automatic so the question i think also the I, I think the question is what sort of universe can i build within that theatrical sphere which moves into the real world so it's like if i take theater and i move it back out on the street uh we all know it from, you know, performance studies and Schechner and uh, um, and and all sorts of ideas of of, of transferring our thinking, uh, or of leaving the stage and going somewhere else. But here the situation is a little bit different. It's like we are in a bubble, and we are the in crowd that knows that there's theater happening, and so that there's a very special uh, uh, universe here. That this is not an innocent person so to speak. Um, so I think in, in some way it's a show that is made 
for the imagination only, that is only made for you to imagine the consequences. It's like when you see something that is a secret and you know that this person is a double agent, yeah, or that this person has some specific knowledge, or you know that something is happening, but nobody else knows it. So I think that is what we're playing with here. Uh, and in that sense, the theatrical heterotopia is being brought to the world and you as a spectator have the possibility of seeing it as such. Um, there, there, I, I guess there is a possibility there of moving further, you know, uh, there were ideas of, you know, having interviews with people, of, of watching in their um, houses, of having the camera go inside. Um, but there's, a, I think there's a, there's a level there of kind of that you're then changing the, the language game. And I, I have, I'm not sure of that, but my impression is that you're losing something then. Because whenever you're changing the language game, switching to another one, you're losing something which you've gained from the from the previous language game, right? Because you've developed something, you've you've kind of been been making your your you know uh, uh, imaginative cryptocurrency, your your little uh, fictional universe of 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 uh, credit has been building. So when you when you decide to let go of it and to say no no that was just theater, now we'll do the real thing you are kind of saying, well, that was just theater. And, and I think that the, 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 the magic of us seeing each other and believing that we are some sort of community and that we do share something together, I think that is something to cherish. So I don't know if I managed to, 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 to build that, I know some people who, who told me that, that I did and I was very happy about it, but of course there may be many people who don't. But if that is possible, I would cherish that and I would not want to, you know, uh, to let go of it to move somewhere else. I liked, this. I liked it because it, it, the space also became quite haunted somehow. It was like a paranoid space. You somehow expected it to strike back also. <laughs> So it was a destabilization of reality, I think, also. I liked it a lot. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was tempted by, you know, uh, the half of my team to have, you know, somebody attack Yannick or mm -hmm. um, prepare some surprise for him or, or fake something or, you know, build something more. It, it, it's not that the temptations were not put in front of me in many, many ways. Uh, but I would say, and that is... That is something which I think is important also that I think you used a very good term, which is haunted. And that is the, the, the aspect of ghosts and the aspect of a reality which is not quite real is really important because one of the characteristics of that space is that it has no taste. You know, that place where we went to as such didn't have a, a note of, of danger or risk in it. There was no feeling of of, of threat at all. So it was in some way a controversial decision to build that universe. And that was an, a universe of fiction. That was a universe of, yes, a haunted house. There are ghosts. No, in German, I would have used unheimlich. Yeah, that's even better. Yes, uncanny, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ja. Yeah, that was exactly what intrigued me as well in, in this uh, performance, this haunting space and like the ambition or the, the trial to feel this place, this space and what actually haunted that you can't see, you can't, you can't also feel it, but you know it's somehow there. And for me, that was really like the, the, the key question in, in the whole performance, like, how do you feel that you now, if, if you don't know it, you now you're in LGBT free zone and it's not written everywhere. It's written in some places, I think maybe not like no, in that earnest. A, that's that's, that's a, an artist's action. Yeah. yeah. But he uh, uses plaques to, to really name it, to really say, okay, you say it, here it is. That's how yeah. it works. But if you just normally walk in the streets, you don't see it. So mm. it's kind of either you know it or you don't, but then you always have like the feeling, well, it could be, no one knows what's actually happening or who said something. And um, 
so what's the general atmosphere? Mm -hmm. We we had uh, one week together. We managed to squeeze in one week where we physically spent the week together, which kind of sell, saved us psychologically because it was really tough. You know, we spent several months on Zoom and the actors were like, this is so crazy and stupid. We're spending as much time as on a regular performance and we're making a fucking show, Snapchat show on Zoom for Christ's sake. Uh, so, so it was really difficult, but uh, we did manage the week in, in, in Warsaw and we spent a full day from morning to evening uh, at that LGBT free zone, that particular zone. And the, the overwhelming feeling of everyone was that there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. that there's absolutely nothing there and they talked to people and you know half of the people had no idea that it is an lgbt free zone and the other half were saying no it's not so there was there was maybe one or two people who were actually saying yes it is and it's a problem and there wasn't a single person who would be saying that we're proud of it you know that we're happy so in a way it's it's really like you know like all these films where you walk around during daylight and the like, okay, what is the problem? What is the problem? So, so this kind of contrast between Yannick and these and these figures is really a contrast, like in a in a in a fairy tale or in a ghost story, where the ghosts appear and this person is like, no, it's not. No, it's not. It's a normal. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? There's nothing here. So um yeah, so 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 it was also it was I mean that was a kind of artistic choice to go into that universe and to actually turn it into a sensual experience because also like to base our whole experience on the non-existence of something when we know it exists I found that okay that would be like you know that's an intellectual exercise conceptual performance um and uh, i know people who do it and i know people who do it in an interesting way but that just wouldn't be me uh so so instead the question is can we go into uh, yes somehow collective unconscious but somehow it's not it's not uh, unconscious it's there is something happening how are we going to turn it into a sensual experience and to make us feel it Yeah, you. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I, I. I. don't have a specific question, but just like I would like to express my uh, gratitude. Uh, I would like to say thanks to see the show, especially to uh to when I watch Come Together. I'm deeply touched by it because um. As a theater student from Hong Kong, now in Zurich, and starting from last year, I really doubt about theater and art especially when there is demonstration outside. Uh, so that when I see the show that I, I really see the hope that to, uh, how can we create the sense of community uh, through theater or art? And also uh, on the other hand, uh, as a person here that I always feel uh, difficult to um, communicate with others about my experience in Hong Kong, because it's just too different from here to the, to, to my hometown, but like uh, when I see come together, I really feel, I don't know, I, I'm not sure about the context behind the show, but I can just really feel that that is something more and so something more more underneath that talking about how can we try our best to connect to each other without um, pointing to any specific re reality thing which I think is also very important for the artists. I mean, in Hong Kong and in China or whatever dictatorship country right now, because like it's very difficult for them to speak for the truth, but there's still some way in art or theater that they can do something. Yeah, so that's just what I would like to express and say thanks for showing us your performance and also share with us your ideas. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I'll just say that, uh, you know, I come from a country with a very long tradition of art uh, in a political regime uh, that doesn't allow for free speech. And so I was brought up with art, which played with that quite a lot. 
and some of it was very directly political and it was just kind of going around some issues, but other art was not directly political. And one particular case, which I always appreciated, was called Academia Ruhu. And, and they were a group that was making all sorts of performances, some theatrical, some, some not. Academia Ruhu. Um, and, and, you know, I was brought up on, on art that, uh, that doesn't address issues directly, but that puts you in a position where you can think about it differently, where you can feel it differently. Um, and also, of course, which quite often did it for very practical reasons, which is that they had censorship and they just couldn't do it in another way. But it became an art, in the, uh, an art form as such. Uh, so I think I have it right now. It's it's in my in, in my veins, you know. It's 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 part of my kind of basic sens sensibility. Thank you very much for your comment. Mm -hmm. Remy. Yes, I would like to ask you uh, about the future. Are you gonna use uh, digital means to? I don't know to into regular place. I mean, whatever happens next, we don't know, but. Uh, are you, gonna, are you gonna, have you learned something and are you gonna keep things from this crazy situation that you're gonna I, I, keep I, for next future uh, uh, theater experiences? Mm -hmm. I, I keep changing my mind, but uh, at the very beginning of the pandemic, I felt that in terms of my artistic practice, that's an opportunity for me. Um, just to be clear, not at all as a human on a social level, uh, but I've always been interested in building unconventional situations. And as I told you, I'm a gadget freak. So I, I use technology uh, not all the time, but in several performances, I use fairly advanced technology and I had no problem with it and kind of redefining the performance as a you know, installation with tiny handheld projectors or um, a space which just has one projection, which is the camera facing the audience, you know, all sorts of kind of playing with what a performance is. So I treated this situation as a, as a kind of invitation to, to move deeper into one specific area. And as I teach at, at uh, Warsaw Theater Academy and also at, at Warsaw University, and I give quite a lot of workshops as well, um, I, I use this as an opportunity to explore what is possible. And I actually found some things which I think are quite exciting. So, so besides uh, that show, I made another show, which I unfortunately didn't manage to get the, the recording for uh, technical reasons, but uh, uh, I made another show, which was just, which was for a combined audience. So a small group of people who are physically present in the theater space, plus people watching on the internet. And, and the whole show is about these two groups. Um, and it's called Patient Zero. And it's about, you know, us being in the pandemic, in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm really trying to kind of see how I can feel this space. And right now I'm preparing a, a show or a project for Brno in, in, in the Czech Republic, uh, where the six performers are going to be performing exclusively on a Google spreadsheet. So for you know an hour, the whole performance is going to be just text-based and it will be only writing on a Google spreadsheet and the, the spectators will be watching by just looking at what is happening on this area. So I've been discovering things which I think are quite exciting and I'm really excited about them and I'm you know, very happy to be uh, exploring that. Um, and I must say another thing happened, which is um, because I managed to make these shows online, they were not postponed and then put in a physical space. So that means I haven't done a show in a physical space for a year or over a year now. Um, and that's a lot of time. And it's a little bit like with a love relationship that you start to forget that, you know, your passion, you kind of drift away and you become somebody a little bit different. So I don't know what is going to happen when we will meet again. 
um, it may be, and probably it will be that I will be going like, oh, this is, this is crazy. Oh, how could I have lived without you? Um, but it's also possible that I will look and I will say, well, that's nice, but I've moved on and I have some new friends now and you can join the party, but you're not my one, you know, one love, maybe that's a bit too, too much to say, but our relationship is going to be more polyamorous now. And I do think, just to say that, I do think it's a, it's a new world of opportunities. Like now I'm digging into the NFTs, you know, these, these tokens, um, uh, digital art that now has these, these, it's the most recent craze that the digital artists now have a possibility of selling their arts, art as unique pieces. And it's getting these crazy, some of the artists are, are making crazy, absolutely crazy money. Uh, but I started digging into that as a kind of way of, of thinking about what is presence and what is unique, what is unique about performance and about being here and now or being recorded or being a copy. Um, so, so I think there's lots of playgrounds that are opening. Uh, but just to make it clear, I don't think that it's the same. I don't think, and I don't think that it's something that like we should all embrace because I am quite aware that it is not theater. And although we talk about theatricality of, you know, enter full screen, I think the, the dynamics of it and the sensual aspect of it and how we feel about it, that it is just a different type of experience. And as such, it's fascinating, but I wouldn't just go like, yes, it's, you know, it's all theater. I will say that, you know, for the sake of having a simple biography that I do theater and sometimes it's online and sometimes it's offline, etc. But as a as a feeling of the experience, uh, I'm 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 not, I think, naive to 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 be just going, yeah, it's theater. Hmm. Just like as if we were in one room. Uh, the feeling of it would be, you know, substantially different. Um, and we would have a conversation. And I, I don't think, just to be sure, I don't think it's about it being distant here because we would never ever be sitting facing each other like we are now. And we, you know, I'm sure you've read articles about, you know, Zoom fatigue and how it's connected to just seeing a face. But the upside of that is, that you suddenly get an audience which you can clearly see and that you have a conversation with people who are all with you. And that is insane. That's like a completely crazy situation, but that in some aspect, it's like utopia realized, you know. Here we have the communitas. Suddenly we're all, you know, this here. The agora, you know. <laughs> Sandra? Yeah, I wanted to ask you, um, you have uh, done this um, discussions with the audience at the end of Enter Full Screen. And I was wondering, what have you taken with you after these discussions, um, especially um, about the question of how being together, of how being a community? Mm -hmm. So I must admit to something, the, the the conversation is to a great extent a structural idea and that has to do with the fact that because of what I was just saying that there's no physical space the end of such a performance is really cruel and it's very cruel for both sides I would say it's more cruel for the artists because they're left alone in their flats with absolutely nothing so structurally I felt there is there's a need for being a bit longer together and for kind of receiving the feeling that people were with you and they appreciated it. So it's not a conversation like usually there's conversations at the end of a, of a show. Um, but that doesn't mean that I don't, that it's not something which I uh, kind of uh, listen to um, carefully. Uh, well, I think this is something which is always for me very exciting 
to be receiving suddenly a multiplicity of voices. Because what you get normally is you get applause and applause is one thing, sometimes it's two or three when there are different groups, you know, with different kind of feelings about a show. And then you get the critics who are, you know, a different genre. Uh, and then you sometimes get something on a Facebook or something or somebody tells you something, but you don't get the multiplicity of voices. And here you get them immediately. And you get people who have different opinions and you get people who live through something in, in different ways. And, and that is something which really excites me because that really makes for a very different feeling of what theater, and here I go back to the concept of theater, of what theater can be. Uh, and something which I've always missed a lot, which is like, you know, we keep talking about the audience experience and the spectator, this and that, but we have no access to that. There are some sociological studies, but they feel like sociological studies. So you also, it's also not about sharing. And then the, the, the talks after the shows in physical spaces, there are always problems with them because they're either too quick or too late. Um, you know, people are tired and the performers are often tired. And here it felt a little bit like it can be something like an extension, which, which kind of also brings back the feeling of reality. And that was something which I also didn't expect. We're suddenly like, oh my God, yes, they were real people who were here. And when they've turned the cameras on, it's not just symbolic. It's a nice symbol, but it's not just symbolic. They see each other, you know, and they declare themselves, they declare solidarity with that situation by doing that. And that's quite a lot. Uh, so that was quite strong, and there and there were some voices which were really touching. Uh, we we made one showing for the people who were who were present in the pictures in the photos who were beaten up, and that was we all we all cried after because they started telling us about their experiences, but also how important that was for them as a voice and as a kind of you know putting this situation as a public situation and opening it up to the world and, and also kind of provoking people from the outside to become part of this universe. Uh, and we all cried. It was just, it was because suddenly, you know, I took these, you know, I asked for pictures of people um, and I got them, the producer got them and we all looked for them and we, and we heard of the stories and I read about the, it's pictures and we're making a show and I'm a professional and I'm trying to make a good show. And I'm pretty cold, a, a, you know, a cold son of a bitch when I make a show. I want the show to be a good show. That is my thing. And suddenly you have people who go, you know, this was really, really important for me. That was the experience, the things I've been through, this changed the way I think about what people can do and how they can be together with me. And suddenly you realize that, that you are participating in something and that you are working in an ethical field and it's not, it's not, you know, okay, yes, I made another show, which on Zoom is so easy. <laughs> so, so that was, I think, the, the, the strongest. It's funny because so I uh, understood this discussion at the at the end also as a structural element, but somehow as the happy end for the fairy tale, which couldn't really end uh, in the good way. So what we were talking about about this uh, um, uh, political uh, situation, which couldn't really uh, had a good end or happy end. Uh, and I was like maybe uh, I was thinking about one thing, and maybe I would like to add. I know we, the time is gone, <laughs> but um, I was asking uh, myself all the time if uh, the fear, which was for me uh, quite the, the most important emotion in the enter full screen, uh, which I could follow and somehow feel all the time, um, if the fear uh, can be something that we can really share with another person. That was my question. Um, I don't yeah, know. Sorry? Who wants to answer? 
because you know that's uh, when you said okay we have been like in the reality but i i was asking myself who we we as uh, heterosexual uh, uh, persons or we as homosexuals you know i think that's a quite problematic uh, uh, thing about this feeling about the, the feeling of fear uh, who are you? And then have, we have uh, really this question, not only uh, about the community, but uh, really about the identity. Who am I and who, uh, who, with whom and with what I, I am confronted with? And I identify with also. Yeah, of course, of course. And, and, and know, but, but for me, I, I had, you know, problems also with identification and, and representing others, you know, being heterosexual um, and and not being an activist in the LGBTQ plus community, uh, suddenly finding myself in that space mm -hmm. made me feel uncomfortable because I felt like, well, okay, what right do I have to suddenly go on, you know, uh, the fighting the good cause for like because I'm directing a show for for crying out loud, um, and also I have no idea what I'm doing, you know. I'm, and this is with every new show, whenever I engage in, in, a, in a new situation, which I'm not part of, that was the case, for instance, with the deaf community, uh, I always have big issues. And, and the way to solve them, of course, is to get as close as possible and to get as many opinions as possible, to learn as much as possible, but also to remain humble and then to leave space for the others to really kind of take that space. So not to, not to really kind of say, this is what I'm going to do. And that is also one reason why I did not intervene, why there is no intervention in the show, because there's a, there's a, there's a moment where I need to really put myself in, as an artist, as a creator, in a, in a place of, of humility uh, and not of arrogance, of saying, well, I'm building this, this space here. I will let as much space as possible for the others and let them identify themselves. Um, but I still think, you know, I still uh, uh, think there's a, there's an ambiguity there, which I don't really know what to do with, you know, this, this fact of uh, the white heterosexual man, it's a, it's a quality that you can't fucking erase. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, there are times when I think like, identify with also, you know, sorry. And what I can't really identify with. Yes. So, yes. So, yeah. so, so, you know, there are times when, when I think like, it's really not a time for me to be making shows. I should be doing something else because the symbolic power that I have, um, you know, I didn't earn it. I didn't earn any of these qualities. It's just something that I got. And, and so should I be speaking in my name then? And is, would that be more humble, like, you know, small narration, like I'm going to be speaking about my family, but then on the other hand, what am I going to be just telling the world about the difficulties that I've had just to try to kind of erase my privilege with what bullshit is that? Um, no, let's, okay, so if I have that power and privilege, if I have that sp special function, then then how can I use it, play with it to to, to go beyond it? But also, while doing it, uh, kind of constantly check what, what, is, what is the position I'm putting myself in and what is the position I'm putting others in. Um, and it was, it was, I must say, quite tricky in this project because also I presumed a few things. You know, I presumed that because there are gays uh, who are activists in, in my group that, I would, that they would want to address that issue, that it would be important for them. And I discovered that it wasn't at the time that it wasn't that they you know one was an activist in very different areas and the other was not really was was interested in other things and and suddenly they were doing it because i was wanted to do it but it wasn't at all their thing so then i had to question myself and and it was quite a difficult moment for me like what the hell am i doing here and I called a few friends and a few friends who, I, who are, you know, LGBTQ plus uh, activists and, uh, and others who know my work. Uh, and, and I had long conversations trying to kind of figure out, like, what is the place I can take? What is the position I can take? Um, and, and, and what happens? What is the outcome?
not to be an anthropologist, let's say, so in the not safe space. I was wondering because like uh, it, there is one moment when uh, Janek uh, is saying like, uh, I'm an actor, I'm not an activist. No? And before you have, uh, he has been uh, outed by another performer once, you are a gay actor. Uh, and on the other hand, he said at the at the end, really with like uh, being angry, uh, somehow in very spontaneous, I felt, so I don't represent anybody. I don't represent also any minority. Yeah, yes, Louise? Yeah, sorry, <laughs> if we have just a short lead time. Um, for me, all these questions of your own uh, legitimacy of staging something that you not feel uh, concerned with um, as a white heterosexual um, male um, artist and so on are kind of solved by the fact that you articulate them as questions in the play. Uh, during the whole play, uh, the people, um, I mean, the situation is questioning the role of theater staging this, also the role of the audience watching this, the role of um, Yannick as an actor or as an activist. So for me, in making clear that you articulate these questions, you talk from your position as a theater practitioner who mm -hmm. just reflects on his own practice in a way, because there is this scene where um, Yannick kind of opens up this question by saying, I'm an actor and not an activist. So he makes the difference between arts and um, politics, let's say, if we want to be very schematically. Um, but uh, in the end, he also rejects all these, um, I mean, all the theater texts from Sarah Kane, all the religious pictures. So in the end, he rejects art by claiming it's just a metaphor. So, mm -hmm. but the play doesn't solve this question, whether a theater should be politically committed or addressing political issues. Um, but one could also read the play as, um, Criticism. I think it's not what you wanted to show, um, according to what you've been saying. But um, the play could also be read as a um, criticism of virtuality and all the virtual world we're kind of diving into since a few months. That was one. Just to one, make one us reviewer, zoom. On, I mean, one reviewer yeah. saw it that way, as a yeah. that it shows the the problem of virtuality and that it kind of addresses it, but at the same time, kind of plays with it. Into mm -hmm. it deeper. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, I think I acknowledge it. I certainly, it's certainly not something which I take lightly. I don't think that, you know, that it's just, oh, we are all spectators of some somebody being somewhere. And so we turn our cameras on and hooray, now we're together and great. Uh, I think it is problematic, but I think the fact that something is problematic doesn't mean that it is, uh, uh, that we should discredit it because of that. I think that means that it's a challenge. And it's an interesting challenge to have. And it's a challenge that comes with this discovery that there is a possibility of being somehow together, which is this way. And now that we know that, the question is, okay, where does it take us? How, what sort of presence do we have? What sort of importance? What sort of power? And we're, I think we're just starting to, to, to see how that works. Um, so, so, you know, and the, the enthusiasm of the avocado that, yes, we are together and hooray and da, 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 it's an avocado. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 uh, that's one thing, but the other, I just want to make sure, thank you for saying that, um, you know, for, for, for mentioning or for talking about how, how, uh, uh, the show addresses the question of my position. Um, I just would like to say that I differ in terms of the interpretation of that, I don't think, in my mind, it doesn't solve that problem. I think it it addresses it, but I, for me personally, this problem continues. And it's a problem, I think it's a very small burden to have in, in exchange for, or as a price for the fact of having the privilege of being the, you know, of being born this in this body and not another one. Um, and so I do think that it's a, it's an issue, uh, and I think that's an issue that is being raised, you know, all around the world uh, with uh, you know the recent uh, uh, translation of that. Uh, uh, um, what is the name of the poet? The American poet that that was at Biden's ino inauguration. Anyone? No. Somebody Google it up, please. We we all have it on the tip of our tongue. And and you know, and it was translated, it was going to be translated by 
interpreters who were not, you know, uh, black uh, woman, um, Amanda Gorman, thank you. Um, and, and suddenly several of them backed out of it or, or were, were backed out of it, um, uh, were canceled. And so the question of who can represent somebody else, um, I think that is a very interesting question that is a, and very pertinent for theater. Uh, and I don't think that there's a way of kind, I don't think that just by addressing it, I'm, I'm, I can manage to kind of overcome it because I think it's, it's really ingrained in the fact that this is the situation. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Great. I think it's six <laughs> and we are really like sitting now two hours, yes. uh, but it's uh, thanks to you because you delivered really great performances to us. And uh, I think we, uh, we will stay remain like uh, with many questions and comments and maybe we will meet next time. So in the next seminar, maybe in a live performance, because for us, it's also uh, does matter. So like the situation when we can't really uh, see each other and discuss uh, problems, not before the screen. Thank yeah. you very much for it. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. You. And also uh, all of you that uh, you could really uh, uh, stay with us for these two hours and for all your co comments and questions. Uh, it was really great. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much, you. everyone. I really Thank appreciate you. your presence. Thank you for the invitation and the time together. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.